to know when we get married that we need to severe because it is important for the two people coming together to get to know each other and to form their own core value system. So after we severe, then we make it permanent. Now, please listen to me carefully. I do a lot of marriage counseling. And then the people that come the most are the Christians. And they are so disappointed in their spouses. And they keep wondering. And he calls himself a Christian. Now, make this understanding. The fact that you are a Christian does not mean there will be no trouble in your home. Hello, somebody. Did you notice that the first conflict management happened among the disciples of Jesus? Some went to Jesus and said, ah, eh, Jesus, tell us. Guarantee that me, I will sit at your right hand. When we get to heaven, ah, ah, if you sit at the right hand, who will now sit at the left? And there are 12 of them. Where will the rest sit? People always have their own agenda. It is not something new. So if you perceive, I do not say that your spouse is selfish, self-centered, self-absorbed. It is not new. It is normal human characteristics. So remember, the fact that you have married a Christian does not mean there will be no conflict. Conflict is a stepping stone to deeper understanding. Everything that God expects us to do in marriage brings us to a particular destination. The only place where we can be trained by God, the best place, not the only place, is marriage. I will start today with a scripture from Malachi chapter 2 and then we continue to build from there. And when you get home, you can read the whole scripture. But I will just read verse 15, and then we'll take our discourse from there. Malachi chapter 2, and in verse 15. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. Because of the opportunity you have given us tonight to gather. We thank you because of your mighty presence in this place. We thank you because you are the father of all creation. We thank you because you created us to be like you. We thank you, Father, today because as we continue in this discourse, our eyes of understanding will be enlightened and we will know what you have called us to be. And everything we desire, Father God, will be granted in line with your purpose for our life in the name of Jesus. Satan, we bind you. We say, you that steal the word from us, we come against you. We release mercy, favor, and grace. There will be no itchy here, but we will hear and we will do in the name of Jesus. And all the saints shout a big amen. amen. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 15. As not the one God made you, you belong to him in body and spirit. And, does, and what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. Somebody say godly offspring it's not just offspring so be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth God deliberately ordained the institution of marriage because he is seeking godly offspring it is not just for not having words to use we can have offsprings Vagabonds, useless, irresponsible, non-God-fearing offsprings. But the quality of offsprings that God is seeking for are those that have the adjective godly before them. So we are not just getting married just to procreate. We are not just getting married to have children because my father and my mother got married and gave birth to me, I should also give birth. The responsibility bestowed upon anyone that chooses to marry is to produce what? Godly offspring. If your children are not godly, you have failed God. So 
it's not just that, oh, ah, now I'm married and then I slept with my wife and she's pregnant and she now has twins. Congratulations, the work has just started. When we do not have the children that God requires, we fail him. This was what, if you read the Bible in the book of First and Second Samuel, did you see any record that Eli, the prophet, did anything wrong? No. Who were the people that did the wrong things? His children. And God took the priesthood from him. Why? Because he did not train his children to be godly. Am I talking to somebody? So the next time you are a single person and you want to get married, ask yourself that question before you propose to that lady. Am I ready? Do I have the spiritual capacity to produce godly offspring? And so when we get married, the first thing that happens to us is that every flesh and carnality in our life is exposed to our spouse. And that's why for the first time, someone is speaking on you. Ah, why do you just snore like that? Oh, how come you just do this somehow? Don't forget you're an adult and you've been doing it for the past 32 years and no one has said anything. The way we adjust to those criticisms make us to become godly ourselves. Many people that separate, they are not able to work out that conflict. Hallelujah. Now, with this scripture, I'm going to proceed and say that every time God calls a man, he calls a family. When he calls a family, he calls a people. When God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, look at the promise he gave him in verse 7. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. Why didn't he say, I will give to you? Why did he say to who? To your offspring. When he had another encounter with Abraham in Genesis 13, God said to Abraham again, I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth. It didn't stop there. In Genesis 15, God still talking to Abraham said, Look up at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them, then he said to them, So shall your offspring be. So God is very, very particular about what happens to the unit of marriage. I want to digress a little bit and talk to the men. Please do not leave the care of your children to your wife. Men always go out and walk and bring the money and they don't know what their sons are doing. It takes a man to bring out the, the manhood in a son. Many men today are raised by their mothers. No wonder they don't know how to act like men. Men should come back home and take the position. Men don't talk too much. That eye is eye of authority. That nod is not of authority. Let them see you love for the first time. Let them see you cry when they are under pressure. Let them see you seek the face of God. You are the best model. Every time I'm reading the story of Abraham and Isaac, I keep asking myself, how did Abraham teach Isaac? To the point that as a child, when he was going to make him a sacrifice, the child understood all the elements for sacrifice. He said, Daddy, we have the matchstick or we have the camp gas. I don't want to say wood and those things because most of you have not gone out of Lagos. We have everything to light the fire. Dad, where is the ram? That means Abraham must have demonstrated, must have done this kind of sacrifice before him continually that the boy understood. And he had made him to obey so much that when he began to tie him, the Bible did not record that the boy said a word. How have you trained your children? Many of us are training our children by proxy. We have nanny, we have cook, we have DSTV. Who is the role model, Auntie Fausa? 
I know we have to work. But you must understand that your primary assignment is that you raise for God, what? Godly offspring. In whatever decision you're going to make, make that a priority. If you're going to choose a daycare center, you're going to choose a school. I often say to um, young mothers, why can't four or five mothers come together and decide to do rotational um, management? Let's bring all the four babies or five together to your house like this. So that today on Monday you do it. I do it on Tuesday. So that four out of five days you are free to do some other things. Or be creative. Think about something. But make it a point of duty to make sure you raise these children for God. Don't let television raise them. Don't let Uncle Mufu raise them. Many children that are abused, they are abused in the homes. Because of unhindered access of wrong people. If wrong people have access to your children, they will violate them. Your children will never be violated in the name of Jesus. So I want us to make that a point of duty. I'm building, I'm still going back to permanence, but I'm trying to build this story in a way that we will um, understand it. Amen? Raising your children is not a private agenda. Some children have been destined by God to be deliverers of this nation. He said to Jeremiah, before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you and I surnamed you a prophet to the nation. So if God has already destined your child to be a prophet and you are there, walking 24-7, you are never there, how are you going to teach him the way to go? How are you going to teach him to hear what God is saying? Your children are not your personal heritage. Children are the heritage of who? The Lord's. That is why that portion, leave, is there. Take care of them for a certain period of time and there is an exit clause. I want to talk to the old people, the 50s and the 60 year old. Leave your children. They are not yours. You will be fighting with God if you do not let them go. Leave them. Hanaya, amen. You say, but I suffered over them. That was your responsibility. Afterwards, parents are supposed to labor for the children and not children for the parents. But if you have trained them well, they will never forget you. They will never. My parents are both dead. They died 10 years ago. By the grace of God, my father was not a poor man. He, he, he didn't need any of us to bring anything to him. But till 2004 when he died, he knew that every Christmas... Funlola must come home and something will follow her. If I cannot go, I will send something. He has 10 times what I'm sending, but that is the only thing he's waiting for. Because he knows. It's like the venison that Isaac was waiting for. And when he gets it, he begins to pray. He begins to prophesy. So I'm saying to children, let your parents be happy. Let them rejoice. Never go to your parents empty-handed. Seek for something that excites them and give to them. But parents do not force them. Train them and release them. And if you do so well, God will reward you in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. That's not where I'm going. Hallelujah. I want us to read the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. After Moses received the Ten Commandments, he addressed the Israelites. The commandments you have received is not for yourselves. That's what he says. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. So that you and your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live he was giving them the command and he was quickly saying so that you and your children and the children after them so the reason you must obey God 
The reason you must serve him is not for you. It's so that you can be a good signpost and a good role model for your children. A child does not become what we say. A child be does not become what we command. A child becomes who we are. You can't just, you can't wish it away. It just happens naturally. Whatsoever you don't want to see your child, stop doing it. If you are hypocritical, nine out of ten times your children will be hypocritical. Hallelujah. Many times we pray, but our prayers are not answered. Because our actions negate the prayers. But today, we will have all our prayers answered in the name of Jesus. One of the greatest legacy you can leave for your children is the legacy of permanence. If you think about the future of those children, you will not think of separation. Nine out of ten times, divorce is about the selfishness of both parties. If they choose to be selfless and endure a little bit, so that for those, I remember those days, our mothers would say, ah, it's because of the children, it's because of the children, and the children end up turning out well. Young couples, I want to please plead with you. Don't be in a hurry to separate. Let's still read that Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 3. Hear Israel, and be Deuteronomy chapter 6, and in verse 3, hear Israel and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors promised you. When you obey God, then you prosper. You don't need to chase that contract too hard. A little obedience can bring prosperity your way. Don't leave your children and chase gold. Many people will travel and separate from their spouse. I never recommend it. Fight the fight together. Walk the walk together. Say, oh yes, he has gone to somewhere, Malaysia. If you must go to Malaysia, go together. I'm not saying traveling for business. I'm saying relocating on visitor's visa. And you are not sure that you will get a permanent residence in another 14 years. Many homes have been broken as a result of that. Amen? Be careful. God wants you to work it out together. Husbands can travel. Wives can travel. You can have, I mean, your work can take you out and come back. But something that will take you away from your home for two, three, four years, be careful. I'm still reading Deuteronomy um, chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. That same one is the same one that was used in Genesis 2. And the two of them shall become what? One. Verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. This commandment that I give you today are to be on your heart. Impress them on your child. Verse B. And um, verse 5. Talk about them when you sit at home. When you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hand. And bind them on your foreheads. The best Sunday school teacher are who? The parents. Now. The message of the word, the message, the word, the scripture does not change. I call it the ancient text. But you can deliver ancient text in a modern context. You don't have to read King James Bible at home. It was authorized to be read by king of uh, somewhere. In your house, you can read message. Amplified, living Bible, anything that will make it assimilable for your children. I noticed that my children could rap and sing a lot of, you know, ha, 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 
Oh. So I looked for a way. I looked at the longest scripture in the Bible, Psalm 119. So I said, whoever can memorize Psalm 119 will get, I can't remember how much, maybe 5,000 there. Ah, they were very young. Hey, come and see work. I, and you know the psalm is in um, stanzas, 8-8. Eight, eight. Before I knew it, after like three days, they said, Mommy, we are ready. Eh? I said, for all that, I said, no. We're going to do it, like I think, six, six stanzas. I said, okay. The 5,000 was not going to be a problem. Then I stood. I was waiting for them to start reading your word. They said, no. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your words. Ooh, 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 ooh. Ah. You know, the SU in me, when they say, ah, no. My son just told me that. Mm-mm. They say, Mm-mm. What they are reading, is it in the Bible? I say, yeah. Say, your word I have it in my heart. Ah, ah. That man has sinned against you. Oh, oh. I join them. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking it according to your word. Ah, ooh, ooh. Ah, ah. <laughs> and they, they, they learned it. Today when I'm talking to them, I, re, I remind them. I say, remember your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. They remember it. When God wants to speak to you, he speaks to you through the word that you have already received. If they have to receive, receive it by rap, by poem, by even if they have to bend a little bit, let them just receive the word. They are the one bending, the word is not bent. Hallelujah. Make sure you write it on their forehead. You write it as a wristband. You write it as a sticker. In any form possible. They sing a lot of raps. And I want to say, can I see the wordings? Because I don't hear the thing. I'm, I think I'm the only one that don't speak correct English. I can't hear what they are saying. I said, can I see? Then I will read it. Fully loaded scripture. But except it is like that, it won't flow. So let them flow. Amen? We like the hymns. Stick to it. Give them what they want. But make sure the word. Somebody say the word. Hallelujah. So, um, many of us pamper our children because of our absence it will never work when we need to give them things we give them but when we need to be there don't compromise it never substitute your presence for gifts if you don't remember anything here today remember that you can never substitute what your presence for what for gifts you're working so hard create a one hour two hours a day um, a week it can be Saturday morning. It can be just create something when the family gather together. And it's not only when they gather that they pray. They can just gather to be gisting. They can just gather over popcorn. Sometimes you can have a very, very good movie to put out all the lights and say, oh, we want to create a cinema in the house. Popcorn, sit down and enjoy it. Let them feel the love of a father. How would you feel if God is sitting here and we can touch him? That's the way it's supposed to be. We are re representing God in our homes. And it's important. Men, don't go and hang out with the boys. Make sure you spend time at home. I'm going to share four things. It's, it's, it's like um, situational leadership. Four stages that you need to build and progress with. As we, as we, and each of us will be in different phases. So you just... Look at the stage that fits you. The first stage in taking care of the offsprings that God has given us is a stage of directing. Like directing something. At the stage of directing, you are like the Alpha and the Omega. You give all the instructions, you give all the commands. If you have children from the age of 0 to 10... 
the approach, the leadership approach to manage them is directing them. Instruct them. That's why the Bible says, train up your child in the way it should go. That word train up is the, is the Hebrew word chanak. That means, you know, you can see the tiles here. We see the white tiles, the white tiles, and the black tiles. The black tiles is like a chanak saying that we have restricted movement to this aisle. So he's saying, chanak your child. Leave, bound, leave clear boundaries. That if you go this way, that will be wrong. If you go that way, that will be wrong. This is the way to go. He says, when you chanak your child in the way he should grow, when he grows up, he will not depart. Even when he goes into a wrong place, there is something that has been deposited that will keep drawing him back and drawing him right. So when we have our children afresh, we have to adopt the method of directing. Everything your child needs to learn, he learns before the age of seven. The psychologists say that the mind of the child is like tabula rasa. It's plain. Whatever you put in it, that is why you should be careful not to stuff it with teletubbies. With, um, I don't know what they watch these days. Bunny. Ben 10. They have enough of those ones in school. Around you, look for things constructively that can build their spirit. Look for fun things that can edify them. Put in them values that they can develop. If I am praying to them, half of my song I sing in Yoruba, because growing up, my parents made us to learn the catechism. I can read most Psalms in Yoruba because that's the way I learned it. And every night we will recite it. And today I can never forget them because they're already what? There. They're already there. So when your children are at that age, they have the, forget about the 16 subjects they do in school. They still have the capacity for more. You just need to know a contemporary way to make it available to them. Serve it the way they like it. We eat akara and ogi. Pap, they are eating cornflakes, bacon and satis. It is still protein and carbohydrate. Check it. Cornflakes is not made from corn. Pap is not made from corn. So serve it in a way that they want it. Look for creative ways. You don't need to say the story of David and Goliath the way your mother told you. Look for a more funky way to make it interesting. Can I hear amen? Act it. Amen? So, when your children are young, live and model Christ's life. Don't do things you don't want them to do. They see it. I still remember the dress I wore on my fifth birthday. So don't ever think those children are so young they don't understand. They know. They know. Don't do what you don't want them to become. Make sure you direct them deliberately. Chanak them. Tailor them. Guide them. Spend quality time with your children when they are under the age of 10. The second thing is guiding. The next stage is guiding. For children development, guiding is from like age 11 to 17. At this point, you do not direct them. You sell the benefits to them. What do I mean by selling the benefits? You know, at the stage, God said, I lay before you life and death. But I advise you, choose life. Then you say, okay. If you must watch DSTV for two hours, how will that affect your mathematics that, you know, you did this? Then you now say, if you are able to make 80 in maths, then I will increase your television time. They can reason. Before the age of 11, 9, 7, just say, hey, go to bed. And that is it. 
But at this point, you don't want them to become rebellious. You say to them, come, let us reason together. Teach them like human beings. Many of us parents, especially African parents, we teach our children as if they will remain small forever. No. Respect their individuality. I have a very bad case at hand now. A mother close to 70 who still calls his son and say, let's assume the name of the son is John. John, see me at four tomorrow. And the son says, you would not even ask, what, um, is it possible? Are you free tomorrow? It can, uh, can you see me tomorrow? You just say to a 40-year-old man, John, see me at four tomorrow. And the boy also will say, yes, mommy. Do you think the wife of that man will respect him? It started at age 10 when the mother refused to understand that he is a full man. Your children have their own identity separate from you. You must teach them and treat them with respect. Oh, mommy, I don't like to eat rice. You're eating rice! It's a different thing if you don't have money. Say, ah, I wish I could give you spaghetti, but this is the only derica of rice in the house. You will be shocked that the boy will eat it with joy, knowing that you respect him. Because we, if we do not treat our children well, they get maladjusted. And when they become adults, they don't act well. That your selfish spouse took it from his home. Don't repeat it over your children. Amen? So at the stage of guiding, you, you expose to your child opportunity to choose. One style I use is I always put a reward. I put a reward. You know, when I read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? I found it as a very good book and I wanted my children to read it. So when my son turned 13, I gave him the book, Who Moved My Cheese? And he didn't read it. And I told him that there's something in that book that if he reads the book, then I will give something. Then the book was read. He wanted to see why he needed to read the book, especially because there were so many textbooks for school that he needed to read. But let me tell you this, children have a lot of time on their hands. When they sit with Nintendo Wii, or Xbox. They can be on for four or five hours. Matching out, they will beat a record that does not exist anywhere. And I'm wondering, the seriousness. I'm still trusting God that we will have believers that will make games. Not just Microsoft. If you're, if you're a scientist, that will make games that our children can play and come up with things can do something. I'm not a scientist, so I don't know, but I'm praying. The amount of money we spend on games, let it come to the pocket of believers in the name of Jesus. Everything you want your child to do, showcase the benefit of the action to them. Give them something to look forward to. Make it a reward. Involve your child in making choices that affect their life. You can say that you are moving from primary school to secondary school. What kind of secondary school are you looking at? Now in the days of internet, let them browse. Let them go online. Let them check. Then you give a boundary. This is how much we're willing to pay on school fees. So it's not that because this person is going here, then I must go there. Then sell the values that you want him to, you know, to accommodate in his life. In the name of Jesus. So deliberately shop for movies, shop for books, shop for mentors, shop for role models. You don't have to have everything. You might not even be educated, but you want your child to go to school. Look for someone that is educated and say, you know what? Look at this man. What do you like about him? Say, I like the way he dresses. He's dressing like that because make him his mentor. How many people have read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad? His dad was a teacher. His dad's friend was a businessman. He didn't like that his dad didn't have money. 
He liked his, 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 the, the dad's friend. So he called that one the rich dad. But today, the man that said his dad was a teacher is now a teacher. Because a child becomes who we are. All his life, he lived with a teacher. There is no way some spirit of teacher has not dropped inside him. He has one of the best training schools. Amen. So the first one is what? Directing. The second one is guiding. Now the third one is supporting. From age 18, we have to learn to let go. You have to trust that your children will make the right choices. We panic at that age because we have not done the right thing we're supposed to do from the beginning. If we do what we're supposed to do right. Now let me tell you this. We always fight peer pressure. Peer pressure is not the greatest enemy of a teenager. The strongest attack against a teenager is freedom. They crave for freedom like a drug addict craves for cocaine. They want self-expression. They want to show that they, 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 are, they, are, they are adults also. You and I know that a teenager does not have the mental capacity to handle certain things. But they do not know. They have the physical disposition, but they do not have the mental capacity. So, a lot of times, they only learn by experience. But because we are afraid, like a 17-year-old that wants to drive, and you are saying to yourself, do you want to kill yourself? So at this point, at 11 to 17, you have already done what? Laid clear boundaries. When our children were below that age, we are told them, the law of Nigeria says driving is when? 18. I will not do age falsification. I will not do, you know, you state all those things. And at 18, we send them to driving school. And then the ninth. The first one learned. The second, then the third. One morning, woke up when nobody was home and drove the car. And we came home. And you know, I don't know how. You just know that the tire is, <laughs> is not where <laughs> it's supposed to be. But fortunately, he came up by himself to say, I've done something wrong. I, will not know, I don't know whether it's the Holy Spirit or it's the, it's the fact that the car scratched somewhere. I said, what happened? He said, I drove. I said, you did what? And I this. I said, okay. Of course, naturally, I felt like standing up and all the judo and karate I learned in school to deck him down. <laughs> I went in, tried to ask myself what is the best way to approach this. And I understood the best way to treat a teenager is to withhold from him what? Freedom. If you don't give a teenager food, he will not be hungry. If you take phone, internet, transportation away from him, he can fall sick. So I said, you are grounded. First of all, let me have your iPad. Let me have your laptop. Let me have your phone. No allowance. You are not going out. By the third day, you would think the man is infested with HIV that has become full-blown AIDS. He would just be going like this. And we said that goes on until the Lord says so. Come and see prayers. <laughs> come, come and see divine intervention. Oh Lord. Oh God. And from that time, everybody understood. I said, until you are 18. And I said, the next time you do that, I will stop you from schooling. Of course I won't. So it's not about, sometimes it may be shouting, sometimes it may be something, but you have to know the exact thing. Then I said, if you are able to keep, to abide by the rules of this house and to do this, this, and this, then I promise, I've also checked that by 17 and a half, 
you can have um, learner's permit. If you do not break any more rules up <laughs> until then, I will speed up since this is your desire. And then you may not have to wait till 18. 17 and a half, you have learner's permit. By the time you are done, by that 18, you will have the license. Children would always come up with all sorts. A friend of mine called me in frenzy and said, ha, ha, my daughter, my daughter. She called the school. The daughter was schooling in England. And A-levels. Called the school. And the school said, uh-uh, she's not back. But the mother was very smart. She said, oh, I forgot. She said, ah, you, the email that you sent to give her exit. Uh, the mother said, oh, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> she called me and said, ah, I'm in trouble. My daughter has forged my name, forged email, and these are children of ministers. I said, those are manifestations of a young person seeking freedom. So I said, said, what do you do now? I said, call. Called. I said, where are you? He said, I'm the about the I said, if you do lie one second, the girl started confessing. I'm sorry, mommy. I've never done it before. I've never done it. Everybody's going on exit. You said I shouldn't go. But I wanted to go too. And she started saying all sorts. I said, you know what? You have to scold her, reprimand her, look for what is a commensurate sanction for that. But don't be quick to go and tell the school that she forged the exit. You may be using a sledgehammer to kill an ant. Amen? What am I saying? At the age of 18 and above, you need to know how to support your children. Many parents lose their children at that point. They are not trying to be rebellious. They are craving freedom. They are trying to say, I can handle this, but you know they cannot. Every time you see the sign, bring them back and say, you know what? Wait a little more. There's what they call delayed gratification. Just hold on a little bit. They want to ride the car that you spent four years to save the money to buy. Say, no, you cannot do that. The implication of it is that I'm still paying 280000 per month to guarantee trust bank. If you do anything to this car, you won't go to school again. Explain. They can reason. Support their desire. Then release the rope gradually. If the curfew is 6 o'clock, change it to 7. If they say they want to do something, monitor it from afar. Allow them. Don't stifle them. Don't force them to break out without your consent. Amen? If they say they must have uh, they, they don't do sweet 18 and they do sweet 16. They must do the party. Let them do it in your house. See what they're doing. Watch their friends. I went for a conference. One great man of God. He had five children. He has five children. And all of them are married to wonderful five believers. I said, sir, how did you do it? That all your children are married to strong believers. He said, I am part of their friendship. I let them meet, you know, sometimes I take my daughter when he's going to meet, I mean, friends. And when I see something in that person, it may be like three weeks. I will look for a way to let her know that's not the right person. That's not the right value. A man called his daughter and said, you know, I'm a man. And we men are the same. He said, before you give your heart to any man, do me one favor. Just before you say yes, let me have a meeting with him once. I will tell you if he's the right one or not. You know, took the daughter out on a dinner. I said, you know I love you. And I wouldn't want you to be broken hearted. This is the way to do it. You start that from that age on. Don't say 18 is too small. Don't deceive yourself. Amen. Teach sex education from 13. 
teach everything. You will see it in my book. I broke it down. Parenting. At what age to do what? Teach. It's, it, the, son, the daughter of a pastor asked the dad at the age of 15 and a half, Dad, when is the right time to have a boyfriend? The dad just fainted. I said, why did you faint? Wake up and tell him. He's a daughter of Zion. I charge you by the gazelle. Do not awaken love before it's time. Tell him to go and read Song of Solomon, that particular chapter, and sing it as a rap. I said, bring your daughter to me. I said, yeah. You ask, say yes. Because all my friends have boyfriends. I said, okay, when, are you, when do you want to get married? I said, maybe like 25. I said, and you are 15 now. So if you commit yourself to a guy now, don't tell him they will disparage you. Don't say all that because she can't see it. If you commit yourself to a guy now at, at 15, what if you see a final one at 19? And a more brilliant one at 22? What will you now do? And I said, you'll be able to keep the man's passion and keep your purity for 10 years? I said, why do you want to awaken love? Now, let's see what the Bible says. This is the best advice. Don't even touch it. I said, okay, okay. Another pastor friend called me. The daughter's school's in America. I said, Dami, Dami, my daughter wants to do tattoo. Because it's going to a church where they say there's nothing wrong with tattoo. But you also need to be knowledgeable. Because in the scripture, there's a place where it says you should not tattoo. But you don't know it. So how can you tell your child not to do it? Hallelujah. Is it family week? Are we talking parenting? Do we understand? You that you are 30, 40 now, you can see where things went wrong in your own life. But those mistakes will not be repeated in your children. In the name of Jesus. The wrong things you did, they will be corrected over them in the name of Jesus. The Bible says he forgives iniquity, he forgives transgressions, he reserves mercy for thousands. Many of us don't want our children to make mistakes. But I remember our mothers then. If they say don't touch the fire, they will let you touch it a little bit. But we don't want them to. It's called overparenting or inf inf infantilizing your child. You're making it a, a, an infant, an infant repeatedly. Delayed gratification is necessary. Don't give your child everything he needs. If you have an only child, be careful. An only child is still going to be in a populous world like this. And they will not write on his forehead, only child. Teach him to compete. Don't give him everything he's asking for. Because that is not the way life is. Don't spoil your child. And for some people who unfortunately have been separated from their spouse, never make your child to choose you above, this, above his father or mother. A child would only have one father and one mother. If you give your child everything you have, you cannot score more than 50%. And nobody has ever scored 50-50. So, always let your child have access to his mother or his father, even if you have irreconcilable difference. Hallelujah. I know these are hard words in church, but that is the truth. And we need to follow it. The first one is what? Directing. The second one is what? Guiding. What is the third? Supporting. At the age of supporting, that is a stage you start withdrawing gradually. Withdrawing gradually. When our first son was going to choose a school, we chose a school for him. In line with the size of our pockets and our exposure. And we believe we have prayerfully chosen the school. And then, about three days to the time when closure for school will come, I, I felt the Lord was saying something to me. I, I called my husband. I said, I feel God is saying this. I don't understand. Two days after, we got a call that your son is going to receive an acceptance from a particular school and he has 20, uh, 48 hours to accept. So I said, no. We've already chosen the school. 
We don't need this other school. But I knew I wasn't the one that was going to read. But we are the ones to pay. So the other school is almost fifteen to twenty thousand dollars more expensive than the school we have chosen. So I said no. So my husband wrote a ten point agenda why the school we chose was better. And our son replied with a thirteen point note <laughs> about all the defects in the school we chose. So of course, called my daughter and said, You, I mean you're on the same level, convince him. So she did a good job, convinced him. And he said, and because we have trained them to be obedient, he said, it's okay, daddy. It's okay, mommy. Whatever you say. But I could not sleep for three days. You know, by the second day, he was going to lose the admission. I said, you know what? Let's accept the school. That means we have two acceptance. But you will not go to the embassy until... You know, we have made this decision. He chose the school. I knew that if I did not allow him, I would have pleased myself, but I would have stalled his destiny. Sometimes you allow your children to win. Am I talking to somebody? It was a very tough decision. It was also going to affect our finances, but I knew it was the will of God. So I said, you know what? You're making this decision is over our budget but we're going to give you the chance and then he said I will not disappoint you I will forever be grateful for this I know it's a sacrifice let your children see what you're doing sometimes they're making decisions tougher than what you can imagine if you can find that is the will of God let them that's supporting and the amount of emotional support you give your child will depend on how they will support you when you need them. You know, the Bible says when we are old, they will take us to where we do not want to go. Because at that point, we are what? We are helpless. Be careful. Can I amen? amen? The last stage is delegation. At the point of delegation, you let go completely. At the point of delegation, you have trained them, you have, you have guided them, you have supported them. By the grace of God, they are making good choices now. Now you leave them. If they do not call you into their conversation, don't come in. Don't say that I bought Toyotas all my life. I started from Toyota 180K to Toyota Camry to Toyota. Give me all the names of Toyota until you now ride Toyota Land Cruiser. So your child says he wants to buy a car. You say, you must buy Toyota. Huh? If you must buy Toyota, buy the Toyota and give him. Even if you want to buy a Toyota for your child and he says, I prefer a Honda. Keep your money now if you cannot give him the money to buy the Honda. At the point of delegation, I am trying to find the English to say this. <laughs> if you take a ram to the altar of sacrifice with the rope, okay? If you take a ram to the altar of sacrifice, what do you do when you get there? You leave the rope. But many of us take the ram. And when we are going back, what do we do? We take it back. The point of delegation, you do not have control again. Not an inch. That is where we miss it most of the time. We still want to be involved in the life of a 30-year-old. That is an anomaly. Amen? Amen? This brings us to the living and permanence that I thought yesterday. And this message is for both the parents, both the liver and the levy. There is license now. The parents should leave the children. And the children should also leave the parents. Does it mean bye-bye, you won't see them again? No. 
It means you are now responsible for the decisions you make. Many of you tie them to your apron by making them to live in your flat downstairs. And men especially like it because they don't want to pay house rent. If they cannot afford a two-bedroom flat, let them start from a... Uh, face me, I slap you. Let them start from where they can afford. Is that not where you started from? They will not die there. Let them start from where they are capable of. Keep propping them. I remember when we got married. When my mom comes, she will say, she, will, she was telling me one story one day. That's her, my assistant in the office. That she went to her son's uh, daughter's house. And in fact, the place was beautifully furnished and well decorated. Ah, and...